My name is Stacy Burkholder. I'm the outreach pastor here at Bridge, and it is such an honor to be able to share an hour with you. If you're visiting with us, as Zach mentioned, uh, we so appreciate you being here. We think you're going to love this church family. It is uh, just the best people on the planet, and so we're so proud of them and thankful that you're here. We are uh, moving into a new series we started last week entitled Closer. Uh, it is really built on the idea that there is, more than ever before, incredible opportunities to be connected in literally thousands of ways. You can contact, touch, like, post, nudge, whatever, you know, you can, you can contact people in nearly any place, anytime, any time of day around the world. And yet the question that we asked last week and really the foundation of this entire conversation is just because we've gotten more connected, do you really feel like we're any closer? And uh, we are going to, in the weeks ahead, really pour into the idea of relationship and what does it mean and where does it go? Because as you know, many of us have a cell phone in our pocket. We have text messages flying every different direction. But when you sit down with the people you love, the people that you know, do you really feel the connection that maybe we had before all this technology came? I uh, just happened this week to be picking up my daughter from her work. She works at a little veterinary clinic and takes care of the dogs and the cats and whatever. And uh, my wife and I kind of swap on and off who's going to pick her up. She doesn't have her license yet. And so we, uh, the, the deal is, is that when I drive up to the, to the uh, veterinary place, I shoot her a quick text. Hey, dad's in the car. I'm ready. Come on. And uh, so this Friday when I went to pick her up, I pulled up and got in my usual spot so she can see where I'm at. And uh, I go to shoot her the text, only to find out I don't have my phone don't have my phone. And uh, I literally sat in the car beside this place like, what am I going to do? <laughs> I don't have any way to get in touch with her. Now she's 30 feet away. And this, I'm, this is the honest truth. She's right there. And I'm parked next to the place where she works thinking, now I can't, I can't I don't know, I, maybe I'll text Sherry. I can't text Sherry to get in touch with her because She's at home, and I don't have my phone, and then it dawned on me, you know, I, you should just walk in there <laughs> and tell her to come out and get in the car. I, this, this is more telling than it is anything, but I, I sat there for 15 minutes, <laughs> right? Because part of me is just like relationships. It's so easy to just send a message and stay disconnected, but to go knock on a door, I don't know who's in that place. My daughter's in there, but what if someone answers the door? I don't know. What if they're <laughs> operating on an animal inside that door? I have no idea. And so I just sat there and sucked it up until she finally came to the car. And then I complained. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> Listen, we have unprecedented opportunities to connect with each other, but there is something missing in our relationships, and it's really the foundation of this whole series we um, started last week building on a foundation of what I think is the most critical relationship, what I know is the most critical relationship any of us could ever have, and it is the relationship with our Father in heaven, with God. I believe that if we're really going to reinvest in the relationships of people, then we have got to start by building an intimate, daily, foundational relationship with our Father in heaven. He is the one that created you. He knows you inside and out, and he also has that same information on every person in your home, every person in your work, and everybody that you would desire to grow and build a relationship with. And so if we are going to be effective at growing in our connection with each other, really growing closer, then we have to start with a relationship with God. Now, I have to stop there and say again, that a relationship with God is so different from showing up to church on Sunday. It is so different from the way that we do religion in America. What it really is is a daily walking and abiding friendship and connection, a humble relationship with our God and Father that takes place all throughout the day. 
When that is in place, then it is time to, be, to begin to rebuild and restore and rekindle relationships with the people in our life. So we're going to start there. This week, we're going to move into the next layer of relationship that I believe if we do not address this group of people, then everything else we do from here will be tainted and affected because we left these people unattended. I grew up in a house with two loving, wonderful parents and four brothers and sisters. Uh, the seven of us uh, were a great family. My parents did all they could do to teach us right and wrong. They took us to church. They gave us the foundation that we had to do the right things. It was just that we didn't listen. We just didn't always listen to what they told us to do and taught us to do, and never was that more evident than when they would leave us alone at the house. So I'm the second oldest in our family, and my older brother Sean and I would kind of be in charge when my parents left. And so our three younger siblings were just kind of, well, innocent, um, but they had, a, they had a difficult life. Um, <laughs> Listen, I remember one day uh, we were at home and my parents had left and Sean and I were in charge. And now we didn't have TV growing up. I had great parents, right? No TV. Because they say if you take away TV, the kids will be like, they'll, they'll do fun things and they'll, they'll be creative. And uh, so we didn't have TV. And so we uh, decided to be creative one day in our kitchen and we thought, let's make like a potion. You know, like something out of the stuff in the kitchen. And so Sean and I were just, you know, young, who knows, preteens, and we're going around the kitchen like anything we can find that you could eat normally. We just start putting it together in this big styrofoam cup. And, uh, you know, a little lemon juice, a little, a little salt, a little sugar, a little soy sauce, a little, you know, Drano. I don't know what we put in this thing. But we just are pouring this stuff together, and we're mixing it up, and he's looking at it. No, we need, let's put some peppermint in it. So, you know, we're just, and so finally we get this concoction that looks a lot like road tar. I mean, it's just this horrible looking thing. And so we determined in that moment, wisely, you know, we're not drinking this thing. Um, and so we need an unbiased opinion, someone that wasn't a part of making it that could kind of share with us how, how we did. And so the first person we saw is my is my little brother, Grant. He's the youngest in our family. He's the baby. And, uh, and so he's over playing with his matchbox cars or something. We're like, hey, hey, buddy, come on in here. And so we get this cup of stuff, and Lord only knows what lies we spun to get him to drink this stuff. But sure enough, he took a big old slug of whatever that stuff ended up being. And, of course, our goal is just that he would have some horrible look on his face and run away, and, you know, and that would be a big laugh for us. However, after he took a drink, very quickly, he began to kind of hold his throat. He started to cry, and it got real serious. Like, we're like, what have we done to this kid? You know, he's drank this stuff, and, he, and, and as he's crying, and we're trying to console him, because in our house, if you made somebody cry somebody was going to pay, okay? My parents used discipline, and they had, like, things, right? <laughs> Our, they were real items that were used in discipline in my house. And uh, so now we're really afraid. We're like, okay, we're just kidding. We're just kidding. You know, we didn't know it was bad. And, uh, and as we're saying this, and he's kind of doubled over holding his belly, something happens that I'll never forget. It's the gospel truth. I look over from my little brother, and here is this cup. And have you ever seen a snowman that's just kind of been in the sun too long? And it just starts to kind of, this cup is starting to lose its shape. Like it's just starting to kind of bubble and, and we're like, oh, that's weird, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mental note. And, uh, and so we're trying to console him and buddy, we were so sorry. And, uh, and, and it's about the time that came out of our mouth, this is the gospel truth, that cup just kind of went Bleh and melts onto the countertop. Now I'm looking at my little brother like, oh no. <laughs> We're waiting for him to just kind of, you know, like on the floor. Like what in the world have we done? We could have killed this kid. And, uh, and, and he, he made it through that. And with some years of counseling and uh, professional help, we still have a relationship together. Listen, is there any question 
that the people that you grew up with, the people that you've lived with, that raised you, that you, you rode bikes with, your family has incredible impact on your life. Your family has to some degree shaped who you are today. That relationship is the one that we're going to focus on today. You see, those people will have a tremendous impact on you, who you are for better or for worse. Family is such a critical relationship in our life, drawing closer to our family, drawing back to rekindling the relationships in our family will impact every other relationship in your life. The writers of the Bible have a lot to say about our interaction with our loved ones. I'm going to share a few of them just in rapid order. You don't have to try to write all these down. They'll be up on the screen. You can try to write them down later, maybe at a real boring part of the service. Um, but listen closely. I just want you to find yourself in these scriptures. There's, a, there's every person in this room is a child of somebody. Listen to what the, the Word of God has to say. In Ephesians 6, Paul writes, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Paul again in Ephesians 6.1, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Proverbs 15, 20, sensible children bring joy to their father. A foolish, foolish children despise their mother. Now, this next proverb, I'm pretty sure, was written by an angry parent in a minivan. <laughs> Listen closely in Proverbs 30. As for the eye that mocks a father and scorns obedience to a mother, may the ravens of the valley pluck it out and the young vultures devour it. <laughs> That's a terrible thing. I think we're hard on our kids now. I mean, this is, that is an angry parent. Let me go on. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husbands. Sub wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And then this important verse in 1 Timothy 5, for those who won't care for their relatives, especially their own household, they've denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Friends, without question, God has great expectations and plans for you as it relates to your family. Dealing with family can be admittedly wonderful one minute and just a train wreck another. Those relationships are so frustratingly complex. I don't step into this area of family lightly. I understand that as I speak to you today, some families are doing fine and there's little things that need to be tweaked and worked on and a simple conversation and communication can help sort that out. But I also know that in many families, there are complex and broken areas, areas that have been stuffed into the far corners of our minds and our hearts, hoping to never have to deal with it again. But I promise you this, if you have broken and unresolved issues with your family, the rest of your relationships are paying a price as well. If there are unresolved and broken things within your, and I don't care if it's decades old or it happened yesterday, the rest of your relationships are paying a price as well. And that extends all the way to your relationship with your Father in heaven. If you have unresolved conflict with a parent, your spouse and your children likely have felt it, even if they don't know why. If you have unattended and broken relationships with your children, it can bring incredible stress, humiliation, and anger affecting everyone you rub shoulders with. Broken marriages affect everyone within arm's reach of the individuals involved. You see, the relationship with our family is critical to all of our life. 
I told you last week, we talked about how funerals can be this kind of periscope that looks into the life of a person and reveals what they thought was important, how they live their life. Now, family is no different when it comes to funerals. Funerals are, are an incredible reflection of what is happening within that family, maybe for generations. I would say weddings are a, are, are a close second. Those two things, when healthy families are put together, are a wonderful celebration of someone's life in a moment where family can come together and be united. But when there's brokenness and hurt and bitterness in a family, those two singular events draw people into spaces that are much too confined, much too close for the people that are broken and have never dealt with the issues in their life. I want to say something that is very important and really will set the tone for the rest of it. This is, this is a critical statement. I'll share it once now and once when we finish. And that is that it is not within your power to change the hearts of the people in your family. Of all I'm about to say, please know that it is not within your power to change the hearts of the people in your family. That is precisely the reason why a relationship with God is so important as we walk into those places that maybe have not been addressed for years. Now, with that said, God will work through you to bring about His purpose. Let me add this important side note. We need to be careful that we allow God to use us and that we never fall into the trap of using God for our own purpose and our own end with our family. You see, God is not some spiritual crowbar or whipping stick that we can use Him to move people where we want them to go. Rather, we are God's tool. We are the conduit of His love, His mercy, His discipline, and His truth. Paul, the great church missionary and scriptural writer, says in Philippians 2, "'For God is working in you.'" giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. It is God filling us and using us in the lives of our family that will help bring about the changes that we seek. Now, with that said, if there is some unresolved and painful issues in your family, there is one simple but profound starting point that is universal in its ability to bring about incredible healing and change in families, regardless of the situation. That simple act is forgiveness. Without question, there are many issues pressing on our families today. If we took a poll of every house, there would be things that needed to be worked on, but I believe it is foundational to fixing a home that it begins with the process of clearing the table of all that happened in the past, and that happens through the act of forgiveness. Today, I believe that God is calling each person in this room, that this is a providential conversation, that God is calling us to begin the process of healing your family today. As a follower of Jesus, I hope, I hope you recognize, as I, as I do, that forgiveness is one of the greatest gifts we've ever received. I needed it desperately, and God gave it to me, and I thank Him for the wonderful gift. You see, when we sinned and disregarded God's love and plan for our life, we were literally separated from God. But then He did the unthinkable, as is recorded in Ephesians 1. God is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. Friends, if you call Jesus Lord, then you have received one of the greatest gifts that anyone could ever receive, the gift of forgiveness. Because of this great unmerited blessing, God has set a simple but profound expectation on you as His adopted child. He expects His children to both extend forgiveness and ask for it whenever it is required. Some of you have been wronged by a family member. As soon as I speak those words, some of you know exactly the situation. You have stewed on it. You have thought about it. You have had conversations with the person and yet has been left completely unaddressed, festering in your heart, 
maybe days old, months old, years old. What you may not realize is how much your lack of forgiveness is really hurting you. You're not really holding that person captive completely independently. In fact, it is affecting you in ways that you may never understand. You see, unforgiveness often leads to resentment and bitterness. Maybe you've heard the saying that resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Withholding forgiveness can have a profound and toxic impact on our minds and our heart and our relationships with other people. The Hebrew writer would encourage each of us in Hebrews 12, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. As bitterness takes root, it is not uncommon for a simmering anger to begin to slowly boil in our hearts. Paul, again, writing in Ephesians, would say, don't, let sin, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives foothold to the devil. Friends, there is no condition that is more terrifying and more broken than the person whose already mixed up feelings and emotions are intersected by the lies of the enemy. As he begins to speak into your turbulent mind, into that simmering anger, into the brokenness and the bitterness, he can just turn our entire world upside down. Many of you know that feeling well. When the first step in quieting the devil's voice and stopping the, your world from spinning is to forgive someone and give that situation over to your heavenly Father. Jesus himself would give us this sobering reminder in Matthew 6. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your sins. If there is unforgiveness between you and a family member, you may not fully realize the freedom and healing that can start if you will only forgive now, on one side, we are commanded as Jesus' followers to forgive those that have, that have hurt us. But just as importantly, we are commanded to seek forgiveness from the people we have hurt. It is one thing to have been hurt by someone else. It is another thing to live with the constant gnawing realization that you have hurt someone in your family. Something you said, something you did unintended or intended, you know the pain is there until the next funeral or wedding. We can just ignore it. We can just let it go until the next family dinner. We'll just sit with someone else. We'll just make fake and, and superficial conversation when there is something going on that needs to be addressed. You may never fully realize the incredible weight that you've been carrying until it is finally removed. It is hard to imagine how many people needlessly carry the burden of sin and brokenness because they refuse to say the three most difficult words in the English language. I am sorry. From the time children are this tall, they struggle to say those three words. Just because we get older, just because... We, we, we get cars and houses. Those words do not become any easier to say. But I believe it may be the key to unlocking a prison that you have been living in for years because you have legitimately hurt someone in your life. And whether it is pride that is holding you back, whether it is a sense of not being worthy to be released from that, from that sin, from that hurt you caused, that is a lie. Not only are you worthy and have great worth. But that thing, that pride that is holding you back is, is, is like having the keys to your own cell and yet refusing to reach through the door and unlock it. Romans 3, we're reminded about how deserving we are of forgiveness, no matter who it is in this room. Romans 3 says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is 
death. No one is worthy of forgiveness, but everyone should have the opportunity to receive it. Sometimes you need to ask for forgiveness. It's important to realize that we're all sinners, that nobody is perfect. It is important, however, and it is not an excuse to ignore the hurt you have caused in someone's life. Jesus himself would give this fascinating example of how important it was in his eyes that you go and deal with the people you have hurt even before showing up for church. Listen to this verse. In Matthew 5, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. See, friends, it may be time for us to stop going through the religious motions in our life and deal with the things that really matter to God. All of this is important, but against the relationships in your life, it is meaningless to come here, to sit, to go through the religious motions when there's people in your life that need to be released from something you've done in your family. Now, please hear what I'm about to say. This is very important. We live in a real world we don't live in an idealistic, perfect Hallmark movie. It's very possible that your offer of forgiveness may be refused. It's possible that your request for forgiveness may be denied. But rest assured, God has heard your offer, and I believe He will recognize it as valid, as genuine as it was from the heart that gave it, something supernatural will happen in you regardless of the response from the person that you're working with. It takes time for hurt people to come to the realization that they can forgive. It takes time for people to, to come to a place where they can give forgiveness to someone else. During that time, you need to know that if you have come before God and said you were sorry, that you needed to be, you needed to be healed, that you've, you've spoken to that person, or that person has offered that to you, that you are set free and something supernatural can begin to happen in your life. In the end, relationships matter. Your family matters. They matter a great deal to God. Remember again the two greatest commandments in all of the Bible, Two commandments that really summarize this entire book are simply to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, your proximity to God will define your relationships. Your nearness to Him will define all of your relationships and what you choose to do with the relationships with people in your life will define who you are. Now, with that said, and I know so much more could be said. Could I give this little postscript, just an honest conversation between friends? Not every house has some deep, broken secret, some dark closet filled with all of the old dry bones of our broken decisions. Some of us just, some of us have just gotten too busy. We've gotten too distracted. All the things of our desire has, has pulled away the one thing that should matter most in our house, and that's the people in it. Would you join me in making a decision today to change what happens in our families? Would you rekindle a relationship that because of your busyness and all the cares of life have taken your eyes off of a parent, a sibling? I believe these relationships matter a great deal to God, and I'm not sure we can calculate the impact it would have on your life to just begin the process of dealing with that, of making a change. I know this for a fact. Maybe the, the thing that I know best from my life that I'll share with you today is you will never regret the time you invest with your family. I've done many funerals at this point in ministry here, and I've never had anyone come up to me and say, you know, I just wish that I had spent less time 
with my dad. There may be no better investment you can make that would impact all of the relationships in your life, including your one with the, your Father in heaven, than to deal and to love and to rekindle the relationships with your family. I shared last week that Jesus is a profound example of what it means to be close to your Father. The last words that He spoke, He spoke nailed to a cross, speaking to His dad. Some of the words that he spoke with his blood running down that tree with his body shattered by the whips of mankind was to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We're going to take again this precious meal that represents that moment, that re represents his great sacrifice so that we could be free and so that we could live and love like he loved. Let's pray. God, would you just do something supernatural in our hearts? Would you do something supernatural in our relationships with our, with our loved ones? <clears throat> Father, I believe so many times we would, we would die for the people we love, but so often we just won't live for them. We just won't do those daily things that make our relationships better. Would you give us the strength to love like you loved? Amen.